Hey guys, I am excited to start the next chapter in the Porcupine Year. But before we do that, we kind of left off partway through, not quite finishing the preceding chapter. So we're going to back up to chapter six. Um, and just because it's been a few days since we read together, I want to remind us of what we're focused on. We had read uh, chapter six, The Path of Butterflies, and it started out nice, but they ended up with a uh, fire and finding two young children without their parents. And so because of the forest fire, they had to get off of the land back onto the lake in their canoes. And while they spend a restless night in their canoes, Quill asks Day Day to tell him about meeting his father. He says, Day Day, will you tell me about meeting your father? Day Day's eyes flashed and hardened. The fire glinted across his face. So he's going to tell the story. And uh, through this story, he shows, explains why he does not trust white people. All his life, his mother had prepared him to meet his father, who was French. And he learned French through his mother, who knew just a little tiny bit of French herself. And he was so excited that to meet her, his dad, and he practiced this, you are my father, vous étiez mon père, you are my father, learning them, looking forward to the proud day when he would walk up to his father and announce himself. He pictured his father bending down then and taking him up into his arms. So that's what we're looking at. That's where we are. Um, and we're starting on page 69 then, page 69. It did not happen that way, Day Day said. Let me pull up and share my screen. There we go. The day did come. When Day Day was 10 years old, his mother learned that the rich trader who had loved her was journeying toward a fort 100 miles north. Day Day and his mother walked those 100 miles. When they reached the fort, they were allowed to enter. The great man was in the central compound, smoking after a meal with his friends. Day Day's mother begged that her son be allowed to enter the house, and one of the voyageurs took Day Day to the entrance. He knocked on the door and was invited to enter. When he was standing in the room, five men by the fire turned to look at him. They were all surprised to see the boy to see the boy who looked them all over proudly, one by one. Suddenly, said Day Day, he knew who his father was. He walked straight up to the most powerful man in the room. The man was the one the others deferred to, the one seated in the middle. Day Day said that he held out his hand to shake that man's hand, and then he smiled. His heart was open. Day Day said he did exactly what his mother had taught him to do. Vous êtes mon père, he said. The well-dressed man reared back, looked at the other men, then opened his mouth and began to laugh. The other men looked astounded, but also sly, and they soon began to laugh too. Their laughter soared, growing hysterical. They slapped their thighs, wept at the absurdity. Their laughter carried them away. I walked out of that place, said Day Day, and back to my mother. And that was the only time I saw my father. Everyone was silent after Dede finished speaking, and then Quill said, in a way that impressed Omakayas as a very grown-up, kind, and unlike the Quill she knew, Dede, I'm glad you left that man and went with your mother, for I am proud to be your son and an Anishinaabe. They waited out in the canoes until rain put the fires out the next day. Only then, then did they dare paddle onto shore again. This time, the land looked sadly different. The trees stood out black in the drizzle, most of them great, leafless sticks. Some had toppled or crumbled into ash. Animals lay dead on shore, a deer, a fox, their fur singed and burned away. As they drew near their canoes, uh, as they drew their canoes up, the family noticed how hot the sand just underneath the wet surface was. It still contained the last ferocity of the fire. They camped there all the same, and the next morning, Day Day and Fishtail decided to try searching out the homestead in the direction that the boy thought he had come from. They were gone all day. When they came back, Day Day said under his breath that they had not found a single trace of the cabin. He also said that everything everywhere for miles and miles as far as they could see was thoroughly burnt. There was nothing left and no one. So it happened that the family was unexpectedly enlarged by two. Angeline prepared a more comfortable place in their canoe for the Chimukaman children, and there they crouched, miserable but safe. Perhaps a trader would know of their parents. Perhaps a priest further north would take them in. But before they could find someone who might know the children, the family would have to carry their canoes over land. They would have to portage through the devastation. 
Old Towel fitted up her red dog with a carrier for the girl. She kept her gray and black dogs alongside her for hunting. She cut two poles for the drags and tied a deerskin between them. She used strips of hide to harness this contraption to the dog, then tied the little girl onto the deer hide. She relied on her dogs to alert her to any other strangers they might meet along the way. Once they got past the fire, that is. This was still the season of raids and war parties, and Old Tala was determined that nobody should catch her family unaware. So that was chapter six. We're going to circle back to that story that Dede shared um, in the assignment today, but let's move on to chapter seven and read that together. This was the opposite of the way, the name of this chapter is Trail of Ash. This was the opposite of the way lit by butterflies, Omakeyas decided as she lugged bee jeans, a bag of pemmican, a small axe, a pack of dried meat, and a bale of beaver skins along the portage to the next lake. Heavy loads were just part of life when you traveled by water. There would always come a shore and a portage between lake or river to the next shore. Nobody thought twice about it, but Omakeyas now fantasized that they would find a swift river that would transport them all the way to Lac de Bois. How marvelous, a calm rapids like a smooth road for the canoes. She saw it in her mind, curving through the heavy forests and sunny clearings. They'd be there in days, maybe hours. She couldn't wait to see her cousin Twilight's calm and shining face. As for Amusin's, would little Bee have grown tall or stout like her mother, Muskrat? After her dream about Two Strike's wonderful fish, she realized that seeing Two Strike would be complicated. But you had to take the good along with the not-so-good, she thought. With her strong new name held close inside, perhaps she would be so grown up an adult now that Two Strike's ways would seem merely childish irritations. The way was difficult, although the undergrowth was burned away. Everyone's legs and hands soon turned black with tremendous soot. Ash muffled each footsteps, and clouds of ash puffed out around each step. The ash sifted down their backs, crept up their legs and sleeves, and itched terribly. It was impossible to scratch those itches while carrying a heavy load. The wood around them were smoldering charcoal. They choked and spat as they walked. Luck luckily, it was not a long way to the next lake, and there was a river passage out of that one. By the time they did get to the water, they were covered with ash like ghostly beings, and their chests hurt. They coughed for days after passing through the aftermath of that fire. But the way turned green again, and soon they were traveling up a river lushly overgrown with trees right to the banks. The trees hung over the water in a pretty canopy, but the undergrowth made everyone uneasy. Soon enough, when the river ended in a tiny lake and they crossed the lake, they were on a well-worn worn path. On this path, said Dede in a worried voice, they would be sure to meet others. Warriors When they had traveled for about a mile, Old Tallow, who walked ahead with her dogs, motioned for everyone to halt, then to hide. It wasn't easy lugging the canoes off the trail and trying to disappear with all their packs and belongings, but the dogs clearly sensed someone coming from far away, coming far ahead, and it was wise to decide from a hidden place whether that someone was friendly. Not friendly. Everyone hunkered close to earth. Here were the people they had dreaded meeting all along. A party of Bwanag, handsome and powerful men, painted for revenge, stuck quietly along the path. There were so many recent footprints on that part of the trail that theirs would not stand out. They could stay unnoticed unless someone made a sound. Hidden in the underbrush, everyone breathed quietly. Old Tallow had her hands on her dog's snout, and they knew better than to yip or yowl. Even Bijins knew better than to make a sound when everyone was tense and quiet. Quill's porcupine, of course, was sitting, sleeping happily upon Quill's head. The only one who might give their position away was the little girl the dog had drawn along. The little sprite beamed with smiles, and her red hair flamed among the trees. Quickly, Omakeya saw her older sister cover the girl's head with a blanket and slip a lump of maple sugar from her pack. Smiling at the child, Angeline popped a few grains into her mouth. The girl's eyes went round with happy surprise, and she sucked in peace, with no idea in the world how close to danger she and her family were. Had it always been this way? Omakeyas wondered as the Bonag passed. They were a striking people, every one of them tall, slender, strong as buffalo bulls, bows, and graceful as birds of prey. 
Strange and beautiful designs, sharp-edged and complicated, were quilled and beaded into their clothing. One wore yellow paint, and another wore vermilion in bold designs. They were focused, dangerous. Omakeyas closed her eyes and pictured a hawk plunging from the sky. Had the Buanag always been frightening enemies? She knew that her own people sent war parties into Buan country and came back with deaths to boast of, with horses or with captives to replace any Anishinaabeg victims who had been lost to a war party the previous summer. Yet there were some also who traded with the Buanag and knew their language, and others like her Day Day who believed that the real enemy they all faced was the growing threat of white settlers. The Chamukamanag did not care whose hunting land they stepped on, Buanag or Anishinaabeg, they stole it all the same. <clears throat> the family stayed in the woods for a long time after the Bonag passed, but eventually the dogs relaxed their guard and it seemed safe to return to their path. They traveled for the rest of the day, still hoping to find water again, cross it, and make their way to a place far from the trail to camp in safety. But the hiding had delayed them, and so they were forced to stop. They settled far from the trail and ate cold pemmican for fear a sturdy blaze would bring the war party back their way. They were spooked and watchful. Still, it was dusk, a good time for boys to hunt. Fishtail and Dede had dammed up a little stream and were catching trout. While they were busy, Quill and Anamikins traveled, decided to travel back down the path, not only to see if they could bring down an animal, but also to make sure that the Buanag were not creeping up behind them. They told Old Tala where they were going, and she frowned. Gego Ginjiba Iweken, she said. Ask Nokomis or ask your mother. You must stay. But because she was busy with repairs to a canoe, they managed to creep around her and elude her strict attention. Omakeyas was to remember for a very long time how their leaving together bothered her. For some reason, as the two boys walked away, their jokes and smiles, quiet smiles, chilled her. She knew, absolutely knew in her heart that something was going to go wrong. She ran after them. They turned to her. Don't go, she said. They just smiled and kept walking. It was useless. Without knowing she would do it, she gave the flint and striker in her special pouch to Quill, even though she'd carried them every day since she was capable of making fire. Her precious string of bee red beads she gave to Anamikins. This was the second time she had given those beads away, and she wondered at her impulses. Nokomis had kept them for many, many years. What? mocked Quill, his porcupine wagging on his head. Is this goodbye forever? Don't go, she begged again. Anamikins took the beads from her hands with a shy smile. This could almost be a love gift. They both knew it meant she favored him, but they were friends already. Omakeya shrugged, tried not to make too much of it, but she said, Don't go, for the last time, in a smaller voice. You know we'll go anyway, said Quill, just loud enough for her to hear. His porcupine blinked. I have a better idea. Keep your beads and don't worry. Anamikins just smiled at her and put the beads around his neck. Then the two strong boys loped off into the woods along the trail. Omakeyas couldn't help but smile at the way the porcupine's tail wagged along behind Quill's head. How could anything bad happen to someone so ridiculous? Missing. They did not return. When the night came on, Mama worried, but the boys had stayed out all night before when trailing a wounded animal. Maybe they are tracking a deer, she said hopefully. Dede and Old Tallow took the dogs out to follow them, and Fishtail made his own search, but the way soon grew too dark and dangerous. They all returned with no sight of the two boys. Yet there had also been no sign of the Buan warriors, and everybody hoped the boys had simply decided to stay the night where they'd make a, made a kill. The family curled in their blankets and tried to drift off, but it was a sleepless night. One of the adults kept watch every hour, and from time to time, restless, Omakeyas woke in the dark to see her mother outlined against the pale sky. The moon had risen, wild and full, and the boys had enough light to see by if they needed to return. But they were still gone in the morning. Now everyone was grim. Nokomis prayed, her hand on a birch tree, her lips moving softly. Old Tala prepared herself and fed her dogs. Fishtail and Dede -Day cleaned their guns, and Miss Gobines examined his bow and readied a quiver of arrows. They all carried axes and stone or steel tomahawks at their belts. They were going after the boys and did not know what they'd find. 
but they were leaving the little ones in the care of the women. Yellow Kettle knew that she and the other women might put up a good fight, but they'd be overwhelmed by the party of Bwanag if they doubled back and attacked them. To throw the Bwanag off their trail, she proposed that the men leave the canoes in the woods beside a smoking fire, and the woman would find another place, hiding place further north, brushing out their tracks as they went. The little boy, John, whose name always came out Zan, worked as hard as anyone readying the supplies. He was a good-natured boy, still in shock, in grief, and Angeline's heart was very soft for him. She kept him with her and took care of the baby, Susan, whose name in the Anishinaabe tongue came out as Zozed, Zan and Zozed. They were both good children, and Omakayas felt sorry for them, losing their parents. She did not want to lose anyone, and she was very scared of what might happen to the men and to Old Tallow on the trail. She had no idea they'd be gone for so very long. And that's the end of chapter 7. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>